Here we present our video from Oxford United Kingdom on Local Anaesthetic Transperineal Biopsy Using the Precision Point System. Evidence suggests rates of sepsis after transrectal biopsy are in the region of 1-3%, to a particular concern in areas of antibiotic resistance. There is also a rationale that truss biopsy may not be so effective at systematically sampling the prostate, nor at targeting regions, particularly in the anterior part and apex of the prostate. There has been a move towards transperineal biopsy with its potentially better sampling and lower infection rates. However, TP biopsy has historically required a general anaesthetic and time in the operating theatre and training has been an issue. There is therefore an obvious advantage to transitioning this service to the outpatient setting under local anaesthetic. However, there is still no randomised trial evidence to support either one biopsy over the other. Transperineal biopsy permits access to the prostate through the perineum in an anatomically logical fashion, parallel to the urethra and the long axis of the prostate. The skin can of course be sterilised to virtually nullify infection risk. As mentioned, it is particularly good for permitting access to the anterior part of the prostate shown here in red. And it allows for the whole prostate to be systematically traversed as shown by these dotted lines and the Ginsberg map shown here, our preferred approach to transperineal biopsies. Conventionally, TP biopsy is performed in the operating theatre under general anaesthetic as shown with a stepper unit fixed to the bed or floor and a template grid. We show here our setup and approach to TP biopsies in the outpatient clinic. Preparation of the room is vital for this local anaesthetic procedure with a locked door or privacy curtain and being able to reassure the patient that no one is going to come in unexpectedly is an important part of what one of our fellows calls the vocal anaesthesia. And a comfortably reclining patient in a bed or chair that permits legs up in stirrups is essential. We have actually now rotated the bed 90 degrees away from the door to improve a sense of security and placed a picture of a Scottish beach on the ceiling for distraction. The trolley is prepared with biopsy gun, specimen pots, 20 to 30 mils of lignocaine, a spinal needle and betadine with a swizzle stick to aid administration to the perineum. Although for the translate trial we now use chlorhexidine. For the local anaesthetic, we now find that the best way to do this is to take 5 ml of 2% lignocaine and draw this up in a 20 ml syringe. We then dilute this to 0.67% with an additional 10 ml of water for injection. We do this twice in two separate syringes for the perineal skin and deeper injections. We generally only administer 10 of the 15 mils for each of these, leaving us with an additional 5 mils as backup if we need it. The pots and blue sponges are laid out corresponding to the Ginsberg zones to enable ease of biopsy placement and to allow biopsies to be placed on a different sponge if the surgeon feels that the biopsy has been taken from a different zone to that intended. Somewhat accidentally, we started using a triplane probe, normally used for transrectal biopsies, and we now choose to use this out of preference for reasons that we will outline shortly. We then prepare the probe to receive the precision point device. A couple of turns of Cosmopore tape around here provides some useful friction and resistance to movement. It can then be secured in place using the self-locking clip. It's really important to make sure that the device is properly lined up at this stage we have actually developed a technique for checking this alignment. We place the probe into a beaker of saline and insert the spinal needle in and out, mimicking a biopsy. The view on the screen confirms perfect positioning in both the axial view, the dot, and the sagittal view with the line coming in and out. Fitted rubber sheaths are available and we fill these as shown to maximize airtight placement over the probe and most importantly over the two ultrasound crystals which sit nicely close together with the triplane probe. An elastic band holds the gel in and the air out. Positioning and local anaesthetic is very important in the awake patient. We use the Cambridge technique for strapping up the scrotum. I'm yet to see a better way than this. The gown is key. 
Betadine is applied as shown to the perineal skin with a view to having at least two minutes dwell time to secure antisepsis. We administer 20 mils of local anesthetic in two stages. First, 10 mils under the perineal skin, five mils on each side, with the needle bent to assist with the angle. We also place a decent couple of mils in and around the anal verge, which seems to be an important area for discomfort. Indeed, we believe the most discomfort arises from the ultrasound probe rather than the biopsies themselves. A DRE to start and then 50 mils of warm ultrasound jelly in the rectum, followed by a gentle insertion of the probe. The images are excellent and with the triplanar probe we keep the simultaneous view function on to be able to see both axial and sagittal views at the same time. The guide needle is mounted as shown and for stage 2 of the local anaesthetic allowed to rest up against the anaesthetized perineal skin. The other half of the local anaesthetic is infiltrated through the spinal needle progressively through the perineal body and up to the apex of the prostate. You can see here the space around the apex, hydro distending with the local anaesthetic. This step can be quite painful, so it is really important to infiltrate all the way in as the needle advances. The biopsies can then be taken in a systematic fashion, including targets. As shown on the diagram, the man has a pyrides 5 lesion in the right anterior zone, and we focused initially on this region with some additional cognitive targeted biopsies. The remaining biopsies are then taken in a stepwise fashion and placed on the corresponding blue sponge before placement of the blue sponges in an embedding cassette or directly into a formalin pot. In the absence of sponges, saline soaked absorbent paper can be used. If one is used to working with a template grid where cognitive locations or indeed fusion placements are predetermined, then the same can be achieved here but in reverse. Effectively, the white spot on the live axial view corresponds to an equivalent grid position and the freehand makes a small angulation adjustment to move to the next position for the next biopsy. In this manner, template style grid positions can be comfortably achieved. On a general note, all adjustments with this approach are made by angulation as opposed to rotation in the case of the stepper system. We believe the triplane probe is preferable to use with the precision point. The biplane view is good for the template grid where one view, usually the axial one, is fixed. However, with the single freehand element of the precision point, we believe that having real-time feedback from both views is important. This is difficult with the biplane probe because of the length of the sagittal crystal such that the two views do not synchronize well in three dimensions, as opposed to the nicely coalescing views on the triplane probe. But we acknowledge that those familiar with GATPs may still prefer the more linear views of the biplane probe. There are several other devices that can be used for LATP biopsy. The BK reusable device, which some centers are also using in the Translate trial, clips on snugly with variations for bi and triplane probes. A coaxial needle such as the 15 gauge argon needle is an important additional component to prevent repeated perineal puncture. There are also the disposable LeapMed and Coelis devices, and these three along with precision point, fall under what we call single freehand devices, with only the one hand holding the probe able to move freely. Then there are the double freehand devices, such as the cam probe, and some have used something as simple as a 14 gauge Venflon cannula. Although with both hands able to move freely, these probably require greater skill to master. We present here our multi-centre data from 10 centres across the UK, as well as New Zealand and Hong Kong. Consecutive patients, mostly in the initial learning curves of these centres, 1,218 in total and published in BJU International. The cancer detection rate was 67% total, with 52% clinically significant disease, even though this included 21% who had had previous negative trust biopsy and 24% of men on active surveillance. 20 men or 1.6% developed urinary retention after the procedure, and just two men developed microbiology-proven post-biopsy sepsis 
requiring readmission for intravenous antibiotics. On assessment of patient reported outcomes at five centres with 56% completion rate, 8% were concerned about pain from the procedure and just over 5% said it was a procedure that they thought would be better done under general anaesthetic. Here is our patient summary and impact statement. So in conclusion, this approach seems to have good hit rates comparable to GATP in this setting, lower retention rates than GATP, very low infection rates, and is reasonably well tolerated. However, there is still no gold standard evidence, i.e. RCTs, although these are happening, and we therefore believe that we ought to await the results of these four RCTs, including the TRANSLATE trial to which several of these centres are now recruiting, before we propose any major widespread changes of practice in diagnosis of prostate cancer. This video has been brought to you by urologists from the UK, Hong Kong and New Zealand. Thank you very much for watching.